Welcome and good morning. Uh, I'm here to welcome you from the Richfield Library. My name is Andy Forsyth. I am the Assistant Library Director. Um, we are so pleased to partner again with the League of Women Builders at Richfield. We have a long-standing partnership with the League to offer opportunities for civic engagement. And one of the hallmarks of civic engagement is being civil in our civic engagement. So we encourage um, decorum in, in the entire uh, morning's activity. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Fran Walton, the president of the League, and she will introduce our speaker, Rudy Marconi, for select person. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this lovely snowy morning. My name is Frances Walton. I'm the new president of the League of Women Voters. Um, I also want to thank our speaker, Ruby, who for many years has chosen to come and give an update on the state of the town as part of our Get to Know Your Town events. Um, really appreciate that you've all come out and I don't want to hold this up any longer. Rudy, I'll hand it over to you. Well, good morning, everyone. You all survived yesterday. You have a sore back. You went shoveling. I know I did. It's quite a bit of snow. We had about 11 inches. It was a heavy, wet snow. We had no breakdowns, and the roads are in pretty good shape. But uh, that's because of all the salt we use. And I know at some point in the near future, someone's going to say, what is all this salt doing to our environment, to our wells, etc." So keep that in the front of your mind or in the back of your mind because someday we will be visiting that. If you recall, not too long ago, uh, the issue was the sand that we used and it was having an impact on the adjacent wetlands and the catch basin, the outfall. So we eliminated that in favor of salt. Now we're the pendulum's coming the other way. But uh, I'll start off this morning by just saying uh, what I'm going to speak about today will be the current status of where we're at this year, how we ended up 23 fiscal, and all of you should be aware, or probably are already aware, that our fiscal year is from July 1st to June 30th. So when I talk, I may not say fiscal, I may say the year, I'm referring to the fiscal year, not the calendar year, January to December, okay? So where are we right now? Uh, how did we finish up the 23 fiscal year, which ended June 30, this past June 30th? Uh, we ended up pretty well, actually. Uh, we had about a $6 million surplus, one of the highest in a long time. Um, most of this due to increased interest rates that we've seen in the market. All of you are aware of that. Probably waiting for the other shoe to drop, and when are they gonna come down? But, uh, uh, that remains to be seen. Um, interest rates, as I said, drove a big part of that surplus, but the school gave back a chunk of money, which was wonderful, that uh, they didn't have a need for. And then uh, also the town, we always finish with a surplus, uh, mainly because by law, we can't spend more than what we're allocated. That's the simple truth of it. So every year uh, we do end with a surplus. So we went into fiscal 24, uh, where we're at now, and um, what we're seeing is revenues are great, tax collections are running ahead, which is good news. Uh, let's see, golf is up 50,000, Parks and Rec is anticipating to be up about 300,000. And you'll say, why would you care about golf and parks and rec in terms of monitoring those revenues? Because to, to me anyway, it's a sign of people's confidence and their own security, financial security, about what are they looking out ahead at? Uh, are they gonna see a reduction in jobs? Are they concerned about their employment or their salaries, et cetera? And this is a good sign. Parks and rec being up 300,000, it'll probably go up more than that because March is a big month there because everyone signs their kids up for the camp this coming summer. Uh, so that's good news. The treasurer, uh, we're running probably close to a million dollars over forecast again. Because don't forget, we set these numbers 18 months ago. And when you're looking ahead, we're all conservative in our forecasts. 
Um, so we're about a million dollars ahead, again, because of interest rates, and if interest rates stay up, which it seems as though they might for a little bit, I don't know, um, we'll continue that good, uh, that good trend. Uh, conveyance is another story. Conveyance is real estate. Every time a property is conveyed or sold, we collect a, a small amount of money, but that again tracks our revenue. It gives us an idea of what's going on in our town as a whole. Uh, we're just flat out probably worse than pre-COVID at this point. It's a seller's market and there's no inventory. Uh, had a quick meeting this morning with Wendy, uh, Leonetti, our town clerk, and you know, February, excuse me, January is about 11 million, maybe. Um, that's probably the all, it's been the lowest number in the last six years, $11 million in total sales. Uh, to that end, there were approximately 14 houses that sold, not many at all. To give you a comparison, um, in, year, in previous months, years, uh, during COVID, especially 20 and 21, our numbers were off the charts with 30, 40 houses being turned over on a regular basis. But now that's all changed. So conveyance is flat. We should hit our budget because we anticipated that. The inventory was already falling when we were doing our budget season. Building is currently off. Their fees that they collect for new buildings, remodeling, they're off about $50,000, but it could come back next month. For example, Beringer Engelheim's anticipating another project, a remodel uh, of their uh, R&D facility. That permit alone would be about $30,000. So that is up and down month to month, but we should finish okay. Uh, overall, financials are looking good. They're looking very, very good. Our expenses are okay. The only thing that we're having an issue with is technology, our information technology, our IT department. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of debate. We will continue uh, relative to the following next year's budget. Should we add a person? And people are expensive. They're our most important asset, no question about <coughs> it. But when you add something, someone and you say, okay, the salary is $100,000, that's where we're adding. You have to add about 40% to that health insurance and pensions and everything else. So that 100,000 becomes 140,000. We were doing this with the town engineer position. Our town engineer retired in 2018, 19. And Charlie uh, did a great job for the town, but we were without a town engineer. The question was, do we add an engineer? Do we rehire someone? And those salaries were gonna cost us well over $200,000 a year. So we've been outsourcing to assess what the impact would be if we did not have a full-time engineer. And this is a little bit down into the weeds, but I want you to understand how some of the thinking goes uh, when we have our meetings and discussions about town operations. Um, we have outsourced now for almost four or five years, and we haven't seen a huge impact. There may have been some bumps in the roads where someone may have said, I wish we had our own town engineer, but overall, it's worked pretty well. So Dave Buccetti, who is our Director of Public Works, some of you may know, he's been in that position for quite a few years, is retiring April 3rd. It'll be a big loss to us because he's a hands-on kind of a manager. Um, and we're looking at that position. Do we hire a town engineer now to fill that position and oversee many, many other functions in town like facilities, et cetera? And we're probably not going to do that. Uh, we're going to move some people around, fill that, split up some responsibilities, and that's probably the direction that we're going to go when I spoke to the Board of Selectmen, select people about that, select persons, which is people and persons, or persons, persons thank you, uh, select persons about that. And they generally felt that HR, myself, and Kevin out of finance, Kevin Redmond, let's figure out what the best case scenario is and we'll move in that direction. And what we do is, look at can the function of the job be fulfilled while at the same time trying to minimize the cost or if we can realize some efficiencies combine some other uh, responsibilities to redo the, reduce the cost. So uh, the 25 we're in the budgetary cycle right now. Uh, current mill rate if, if we 
took a snapshot today. Uh, this is before the Board of Finance, before the Board of Select persons had made their decision, um, is about 3.25%. That's a very, uh, compared to years past, that, that's a significant, I'll call it significant, a significant increase, 3.25%. But again, we're not all the way through, and, and there's some reviews, uh, serious discussions and votes that have yet to take place. What if that is made up of is a 2.98% increase for town operations, including roads, everything. A 3.97% for the schools, all in it, unless that's changed, I don't know. And then capital, separate from operating, now your capital, your long-term uh, cost, trucks, ambulances, that type of thing, is 6.9 billion. And I want to spend a little bit of time on that, about our capital expenses, because when we did many, many years ago all the schools, uh, in 2010, uh, the police department wanted to do an upgrade. That failed on the budget by three to one. We took it off the table, and it's been off the table since then. And the reason for that is we wanted to wait until we paid off all the work we did on the schools from a borrowing perspective. This year is our final payments on all the schools. So we need to look at a new PDFD uh, facility. But aside from that, because I'll talk more about that later, our capital this year came in, everybody sends in their requests, a little over $10 million. Going back to when we, uh, in the 2005 to 10 area, we were at about 2.5, 3.5. Uh, uh, we raised that cap to five million after 2010, and now we see it climbing up into the ten million dollar area. Now we haven't gone through our cuts, but the reason for that is expenses have gone through the roof. An ambulance, which we used to pay 198, then 230, 250, today is 450 thousand dollars. We need a new ambulance. We have three of them. Our call volume is going up. The town is over 25,000 people. Every time you build an assisted living facility, which is great, that generates about 300 calls a year from our ambulance because people are very quick to dial 911, right? As soon as someone coughs, someone says, I don't feel well, dial 911, right? Um, it really drives our costs substantially. So we need to keep our eye on assisted living, but the example I was giving the ambulance is only a small part of what we're experiencing in cost increases. We have a new roof schedule for Bridgeberry Elementary School. What we do in our five-year capital, we put it out five years, each year we walk it down so the Board of Finance gets an idea of what the needs of the town are going to be over the next five years. Um, that new roof, is now at 2.4 million, is what the estimate is. From 1.1, almost a million dollars, not over a million dollar increase. And we have three roofs that need to be done in the next five years. So we put uh, a stop to that, and we're going to look at our roof needs over the next five to 10 years, have a consultant come in, one of the things we looked at is converting them to a truss roof instead of flat. That way the water sheds, there's no ponding, and you get a greater life. Um, the, the consultant said, forget about it. That's gonna cost you so much, the return isn't there. It's a massive undertaking. There are fire code issues, et cetera, et cetera. My advice is to stay away from it, but when we redo our roofs, let's really get into the engineering of it and perhaps give a little bit more slope what is known as a flat roof, so it drains better, the drainage needs to be kept clean, the drain, roof drains, etc. But again, why 10 million when a roof goes from 1112 up to 2.4? You get an idea of what we're trying to deal with. This year, we would love to get that number under our goal, just to wrap up the capital, would be to get it under six. So we got a million dollars. It's at 6.9 now. To get it under six is cutting a million. That's huge. 
radios, portable radios that the officers use. They're on their hips, they pick them up. As soon as they leave the vehicles, they're on their portables. It's been 10 years since we did new radio. It doesn't seem that long. It seems like yesterday, but 10 years. And they're saying a lot of other communities have switched frequencies. The state has a frequency. Danbury comes into town. You cannot communicate with Danbury on a portable because they're a different frequency. I learned more about radios than ever I thought I would. But what everyone is going to is what it called a tri-band radio. So a portable. So when you pick it up, it gives you the flexibility to talk to everyone. Each radio is $13,000. Wow. So to give you an idea of what we need, the FD, probably about 40, 44, F, uh, PD about 50. Total cost is over a million dollars. <laughs> we can't do that. You know, that was in the 10 million. And they said, but our officers need to be able and the firemen communicate when they're outside their vehicles. Or the, the portables are their lifelines. So these are the types of decisions that we are making now that we're going to ask you to vote on, but I want to explain today that what we did with the radios is we said, do we need them all in one year? For example, can you take, how many people do you have on the ship? I'll pick on the fire department. Twelve. That includes line people, fire chief, assistant, and a couple of others. I said, why don't we order 20? have a bank charging station, people come into work, they sign off the radio, it's charged, we have backups, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's what we're looking at. The fire department broke, broke it down to be spread out over three years. The PD said we need them now and everyone should have one. Uh, they're saying they need it all in one year, which is about 525,000. Um, we initially spread it out over three. I said, if the FD can do it, you can do it. I'm not an expert in PD work, and they didn't like that comment at all. You need to understand better. Um, okay. So I said, why don't we go to two years? That gets you started, and let's see what we can do to help defray that annual impact so we can begin spreading things out a little bit. But those are some of the things we're working on. Um, then you go to the highway department and our roads. You know, our roads, we're spending our request uh, this year for roads is going to be about 2.6 million, I believe. Yeah, 2.669 is what we're asking for to do our roads. We know we put roads on the, on the budget. That's the number one yes vote that you all vote for. <laughs> yeah, you want the road. Roads are not controversial. In fact, we have department heads that say, I need a new pickup truck and you just put it on with the roads. <laughs> right? I didn't fall off the turnip truck. Uh, but they're funny. They, they, and, and their demands, they're not, not even demands, they're telling us what their needs are. Uh, but the roads, what we're experiencing with the change in storms, you know, I don't know if climate change is real. I feel, personally, I believe it is. Others don't. But whatever is happening, is changing the type of storms we get. We used to get a couple of days of rain, an inch or two. We can have a storm come through that dumps three or four inches in five, six hours. And what has happened in one area, I'll give you an example, I don't know if any of you live up there, but Spring Valley. The water comes off the hill up in that area and it is absolutely, take a ride, look uphill, stop, be safe, flashers, but you'll see ravines that have been cut through this hillside where this water and the drainage just can't handle it. So we need to look at that as a major project as well as Ridgeberry Road. Our director of public works, Dave Pichetti, I mentioned before, wants to do a total rebuild in three phases of Ridgeberry Road, starting at the Danbury line up to George Washington, George Washington down to about Regan Road, and then the third one from Regan into 116 massive four or five million dollar project but he said we need to begin controlling the water that is runoff and some of which goes down to that spring valley area capture it and actually diffuse it underground by putting in um, galleys four by fours or what have you to allow a lot of areas but when you have the soils you do in ridgeberry anybody who live up in ridgeberry you know, ridgeberry ridgeberry soils is all clay 
uh, very poor porosity. It doesn't take water. You can dig a hole, pour water, and then come back in two days, the water is still there. It takes forever for it to dissipate. It's just not good soil. So that's going to be an interesting experience. We've started on the engineering uh, to look at that. But do we do that as a separate referendum? Do we look at Ridgebury as a total rebuild? I'm leaning more toward let, let's take our time before we jump into these big projects. You know, the, I think as residents, as taxpayers, we need to look at one project at a time to understand it, what the financial consequences are going to be if you vote yes or if you vote no, um, and how it impacts your taxes going forward, and what is the need of the town? How does it rank for other needs that we may have? Uh, that, that's going to be a big decision for us. So capital projects, uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that's being done today. Uh, I'll start off down in Branchville. Anybody have any questions at this point? I've been talking up here about mm -hmm. different things. Yes, Vincent. Just one question. Really. <clears throat> Through these budget meetings, um, since we have more government function, right, you have a longer term view, do you typically ask, or does someone ask, about investments for cost reduction? I mean, I'm hearing a lot about delaying things, spreading things out. That's great. But do the departments actually come in with, here's an investment we would need now, or could use, sure. to get cost reduction over a longer period of time? In every department. Um, one example, I'll go back to highway. Uh, we have an excavator that we use for our brush pile in the back. We take all of our tree cutting, we put them through a whole tree chipper. The excavator does that. It was about 10, 15 years old. The question was, do we need to put in for a new one? They rebuilt it for $25,000 and it's still running fine. So those, yes, those types of considerations, absolutely <laughs> can it be rebuilt. The Vactor truck, for those of you who may not know what the Vactor truck is, that's what cleans out all of our catch bases. It's a $700,000 cost for this truck. Um, can we rebuild it? The answer is no, we can't. Now the WPCA usually uh, participates. The last one they paid 50%, but they're only using it about 20% of the time, so we're gonna be allocating 20% of the cost to the WPCA, but that's a dual use because when our sewer lines get clogged, uh, with whatever, the high pressure hose on the back of the truck, it not only has great suction to clean everything out, but you can reverse it and blow things out, open up pipes. Uh, they'll use it to open up some, a lot of blockages. That truck, we can't rebuild because there are so many pumps, so many valves. To do a rebuild would be close to just buying a new truck. But yes, we look at that all the time. We took an old tanker. Uh, from the fire department, took the actual tank off and used the cab and chassis to convert it to a triaxle dump truck, a bigger truck that carries a lot of the wood that we cut down to the pile to be uh, chipped up, split, etc. cetera. Um, when we did that 10 years ago, I said to the highway department, we'll do this, and it was like $30,000 to make that conversion, but I don't want to see it show up in the budget in five years where you need a brand new triaxle. Well, guess what showed up this year? <laughs> a brand new triaxle in year five or four, but it's $300,000. And I said, no, we're not going to do that. You got to think outside the box. Come up with another. Buy a used truck. Everyone out there buys used. Sometimes you get a lemon, but there are a lot of good, there's a lot of good equipment out there that we don't use it every single day, but we can certainly reduce costs. So thinking outside the box or different ideas of how to rebuild equipment, get longer life out of it, we do talk about it. Do we miss some things? I'm sure we do, because there's so many of them. But yeah, any other questions at this point? Yes? Um, going back to the roofs, uh, are you incorporating any discussion of uh, solar panels? Which might down the road yeah, the solar energy. I know Vincent's from uh, here on the Energy Committee. Who else is here on, from Energy? Anyone else? Um, we've been doing, Jake Muller, who's our Director of Facilities, uh, we've done, well, almost every school. We still have 
VP to do, uh, Branchville's done, Farmingville was one of the first, Scotland, Barlow, I don't know, do we have Barlow? I know we have Scotland done. Scotland School actually last year ran for three months totally off the grid. So we, we are saving money, we're reducing our carbon footprint. Um, however, the money that we're saving uh, is coming back in energy costs, and that's a Board of Education expense. I would like to think that we would say, okay, a credit, $300,000 for solar panels, but it doesn't work that way. But we've done the Venus building this past year, which is, we're running about, a, at the high school, uh, some people don't like this. We're doing a solar canopy in the parking lot of the uh, students' parking lot, so facing the school on the left, across from Manonasco. Um, it's going to be, there'll be about 14, uh, 18 feet high. These are all canopies covering that whole parking lot. Once completed in combination with both the solar panels on the roof of the high school and over at Scotts Bridge, we're looking to see a 30% reduction in the cost of energy for that campus. So yes, we are looking at it. The next thing we want to look at, since I'm on that topic, would be heat pumps. Uh, that's a major investment, and in schools where you may not have ductwork, that would include having to put ductwork in, right? So um, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but it looks more and more that with the improvements with technology, and the heat pump systems that they're at a point now with a reliable and, and an efficient way uh, to heat our building, certainly. I don't think we're at the point of going to batteries, which it. Uh, I don't think the technology is there yet, but uh, definitely the next move would be toward heat pumps. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, have yeah. you considered solar canopies on the King Ah, <sighs> Yes and no. Uh, if you're asking me personally, yes, I thought of it, and I said, would that defeat the purpose of having open space? Well, and I, I'm kind of torn there that McKeon Farm, to me, uh, and again, I'll speak for myself only, that driving up there and looking at that uh, is perhaps, you know, I, I've often said, the last frontier of our town. It's undeveloped, it's beautiful in its nat natural state. To begin uh, putting solar panels on open space, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if uh, the townspeople, conservation. I don't think they have the appetite for that. But we can certainly ask the question. Yeah, a solar farm is what you're talking about. Well, yeah, and they're high enough that the sheep certainly will be very happy to have the shade. Number one, they they graze under. Right. Uh, but it's. It's energy just waiting to be captured. And I agree. I'm the, a farm girl. I want the farm. Yeah, a major consideration when conservation accepts money uh, donated for open space, they send a, a letter out every year, as you all know. People that donate their land for open space uh, are pretty restricted that this is to be maintained in its natural state in perpetuity and that language goes into the deed for all these properties. So number one, I don't think we're allowed to change the character of the land for the deed. And uh, the only way you can get a deed changed is if the person who agreed to it agreed to a change, and with most of our open space, those people are gone, uh, right? So uh, I, I think it would be an uphill battle not only from the aesthetics, uh, but from the legal perspective to begin using open space for anything like that. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know, it's up to you. But I was gonna talk about projects that are going on now. A lot of you saw the boardwalk along Lee Ju Way and said, what the heck is that? <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. Why would we be spending money to build something like that? And I'm involved with a lot of different organizations across the state. Uh, chairman of the COG, Western Connecticut Council of Governments, 18 towns. And grants come through the COGS all the time. And I'll be the first one to put my hand up, we'll look into that. And this was a grant uh, that we didn't spend the full amount, but to build a boardwalk, I think there are gonna be some step changes that need to be made. Uh, that railing is pretty ugly uh, when you drive down through there. However, 
that is just one spoke in the wheel of a, a plan that's in place, and, and we're getting there, where you'll be able to walk one mile around the Parks and Rec Center that's paved, and then walk all the way to Branch Hill. Uh, you get the Florida Road, how we handle Florida Road, it's a pretty narrow, winding road. Uh, we've got a few ideas there. But right now, the boardwalk was meant to connect Farmingville up to the uh, canine, right? Next year, we've already gotten uh, bids in under our grant program called LOSIP, Local Capital Improvement Program. Um, we used to get 153000 a year as a per capita base grant. It went up. And I don't know why it went up, but when grants go up, you don't ask why. You just want to verify it. And we verified the number, so it's gone up to about 280000 uh, no, 230, excuse me, it's about an $80,000 increase, 230, which is great. So next year, we have a sidewalk from the pedestrian bridge on 35 by Parks and Rec that'll go all the way up to Copps Hill. What we need to do is if you look at the two pretty sizable stone walls on 35, one in front of the Hurt Mannheimer's daycare facility there, and then the next one up toward Pandy's. The one at Pandy's we're going to expose and leave. We can meet ADA requirements with the uh, with the grade with the slope by leaving that in place. The one in front of Hurt Mannheimer's we may have to move back. So all of that has been bid on, and we feel very comfortable uh, that we can achieve that project this coming year. So that's on the books to be done, as well as under the LOSIT program, a sidewalk that'll go down New Street and then come back on Pound Street. That'll be all new. We finally have all of the uh, proper, that was a connectivity grant, something different than LOSA, <coughs> it's not LOSA. But again, it's about 400,000 we got in grant money for that. Going back to the boardwalk, it was about 3.2 million uh, that we received for that. We'll put the sidewalk in next year from Parks and Rec up to Cobbs Hill. We walk across, go down to Farmingville, rapid flashing beacons. Uh, like the one on Main Street, the one on Rockwell, has been installed at Farmingville. That pathway will take you up to uh, the canine, and then following year, we'll do from the canine over to the Goodwill with a switchback that'll go up to the rail trail, and then you continue your walk all the way down to Florida Road. It's about a 10-mile walk. Why do we need that? I grew up in Richfield. We rode our bikes everywhere. The only rule in the house was be home by the time your father gets home for dinner. That was a rule you rode anywhere you want. Today you can't do that. You can't, you're not, with society today, some of the issues, uh, you're not going to let your kids go out by themselves and ride bikes. Uh, the safety, the cars, the traffic, God, you just can't do it. Where are they to go? Where can you go with your kids? A lot of people go to parks and rec. But with this, you'll be able to go all the way down. And yes, I know bikes aren't allowed on the rail trail. We need to address that. By the way, we're the only rail trail in the state of Connecticut that does not allow bikes. Some people like that, right? Uh, others don't. But we're going to have to address that because I think we're doing a disservice to the community, the people, by not allowing them. But anyway, you'll be able to go all the way to Branchville. And I think that will be, in the coming years, if we look forward another 25, 30, 35 years, that'll be something in the town that will be treasured by a lot of people, an opportunity to go for a walk and not have to worry about cars or traffic. Um, big issue, by the way, this morning there was a horrific accident on 35 down by the uh, gas station at Holta and Rich Drive. We shut it down, the police shut it down at Rich Drive. Uh, trying to put that all together. It'll still be closed probably for another couple of hours because they're doing the uh, accident reconstruction to try and figure out everything, whether there was a medical issue involved uh, that caused the chain reaction of the vehicles, but some serious injuries. Um, Branchville, uh, you saw phase one's been completed, all the sidewalks, the lamps, lamps landscaping will be done in the spring. There was a reconstruction of the 102. Remember how wide it was? It's been narrowed down. And you'll notice there's new traffic light with crosswalks. That's to create Branchville uh, into becoming a more pedestrian-friendly community. 
Branchville never had sidewalks. Branchville was the forgotten child of the town. We never invested anything down there. Um, but now we're doing that. And the thought is uh, to begin looking at Branchville as the future for how we see Ridgefield developing. Now, a lot of you are going to say, why develop it at all? Shut it down. We don't want anyone else to come, and come here. We love it the way it is. My parents said that in the 50s. And, you know, uh, their response was, well, people need to live somewhere. What are you going to do? You know, we need to uh, provide for that. And then in the 70s, late 60s, 70s, and 80s, Jerry Tuscio built 100 houses a year to meet the demands of IBM, to meet the demands of commercial aviation. That, we had a huge increase in our population. And since then, it's continued to go up. So we're over, a little over 25,000 people. We're not going to stop growing. People are going to continue to reproduce. That's nature, right? It's going to happen. We can't stop that. Um, so what is Richfield's responsibility there? We know we've created, through the help and hard work of so many volunteers, uh, a, a, an incredible destination town. The arts and culture being recognized as the number one arts and culture as the first one in the state of Connecticut for arts and culture has created Richfield become a destination town, hence some of the traffic that we have. Um, but as we grow and people experience Richfield, it's a great place to live. You know, it's, they get to the fountain, take a left, and they said, where are we? This is where we want to uh, raise our family. How are we going to handle the increase in population? The census shows us that the New York metropolitan area is getting bigger and bigger. The, the suburbs are growing now. We were 5,000, we're 25,000. Uh, Richfield's characteristics of then are like Sherman what it is today, right? Um, but people are still going to want to move in here. We did a study, it, it's amazing, in government. Uh, this study was completed in 2017. This is called Branchville. And it's a TOD called the Transit Oriented Development. And back then, Governor Malloy said, we need to look at our train stations as transportation hubs for the future. And he was absolutely correct, because a lot of you complain about 35. It's ridiculous. Travel through Main Street Saturday mornings. As our town grows, we have to look at that. Public transportation is an alternative we have that I think, as a government, we need to look at more closely. The Branchville line, Danbury Branch line, um, is a golden opportunity to begin looking how that fits into the vision of the future. And that's what this plan looks at, more from a uh, housing, a retail. How do we look at Branchville and what happens to them? Don't forget, right next door is the Georgetown environment. That has been vacant for many years. It's still partially contaminated. And Ready has a sewer plant, but they want to save it for the Georgetown wire mill. I don't know if it's ever going to get built in our lifetime. Well, mine's kind of short. I don't know about yours. <laughs> it's amazing how time goes by. Um, but Branchville is an exciting opportunity to begin looking at that. For example, uh, there's one architect in town who has a concept in mind where you would have a Gen Y, Gen Z complex, 40, 45 units, where all the units would be affordable, not because they're 8-30G, but because of the size. When you're in college, you're kind of used to being in a small apartment, a small dorm room, having roommates. So the thought is to create something in that 600 plus or minus in there per unit. So you have a bed, you get up in the morning, your bed recesses into the ceiling, you have a movable wall that comes out, you can create an office, have a little living room, but it creates the independent living for young people. Yes? You had 600 to 700 square feet. Square feet. Yes. Yeah, where did I say? Just, you did. Oh, okay. yeah. Six to 700 yeah. square yeah. feet. Yeah. 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 Not yeah. six or 700,000 yeah. dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I don't know. By the time they get built, who knows? But small and, and affordable for young people because we, we are a cross-section. The average age has gone up in Richfield, by the way. It's at 45 now. 
that was 43, 44 more or less in 10 years. It's up to 45. And I think that's because a lot of us seniors, I'm a senior, uh, plan on living, aging in place. When you look around and you begin saying, where am I going to live? Yeah, I don't need a four bedroom home anymore. It's just the two of us when you realize it. You're from the TV room to the kitchen to the bedroom. That's your life. It's kind of sad, right? <laughs> we do go out. <laughs> but when you look at that and you want to scale it back but stay in the community, where are you going to go? And there's little choices. This kind of a development here would give that opportunity, plus with transportation. Many people still like to go to New York on a Sunday afternoon for a show, Saturday afternoon, matinee. You have a train right there. You just walk to the train and grab it. Uh, or a bus. You want to use buses. But you're going to hear a lot more about Branch Hill. Uh, and, the, and I know Rob is here, Rob Hendrick from the Planning and Zoning Commission. I was there last, two weeks ago, last week? Yeah. The 6th, February 6th. And uh, spoke about it. The two previous meetings, they invited in the executive director of the COG, uh, that looks at planning for the region from Greenwich to Westport, north to Sherman, uh, what's going on there to get his input. Um, they also invited in uh, Francisco Gomes, who was the consultant for FHI for Cheryl Halliday, that really did all the legwork and was the project leader on this project, to find out more from Francisco and his research and what he did. Planning and Zoning is going to be studying this over the next several months, maybe six months, plus or minus months. What do we do with Branchville? Is this the right plan? Do we implement it? What is the zoning? Because zoning is going to be critical. Zoning is going to dictate how many units per acre. The state has just came out with a TOD plan. It hasn't been voted. It came out of committee uh, where you have an option for 12 units, 15 units, 20 units per acre. Uh, that's the type of development we're looking at, where there is density, uh, but it's planned. Do you use conventional zoning uh, based on uses, or do you do form-based zoning, where you can have a drugstore or pharmacy anywhere, but the architecture all has to be relatively the same in this area. So they've got a lot of work to do, and we're a bit away from formalizing and doing anything here. It's going to take time. Uh, but that's something uh, for the future. So with the boardwalk, you'll be able to walk all the way down to this new development. <laughs> right? Uh, the sewer project has been uh, a project from hell. Uh, to say the least. Uh, it's a stinky subject, but um, we had to do an upgrade. We had to do it. Uh, DEEP, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, requires a 20-year review of all sewer plants. Uh, by the time they got around to it, it was 25 years. Now we're over 30 years. You have bearings and motors and systems, technology. Everything needs to be looked at. The whole plant needed to be upgraded. The question is, do we increase the capacity of the plant? And the only capacity increase was accommodated for the closure of the Route 7 sewer plant. That's located right behind Pond's Edge. Uh, that plant was rated, I think, 120,000 gallons a day, flows around 60, at a peak, maybe 70. Uh, it's not fully utilized. That area has not been developed, but there are certainly applications that have been submitted um, that will develop out that property and, and use a substantial portion of that. But we're up closing the plant, upgrading the pump station, and pumping in everything up into the plant here on South Street so that we realize economies, right? We're not having to pay for operations at two separate plants. Um, that hopefully will be done this summer. Uh, that's kind of the promise now. We did call the bond company, WPCA did, for the project because SpectraServe, which was the contractor hired, was not performing and missed all the dates. I mean, it didn't even come close to hitting any of the completion dates. So the bond company was came in all they did is hire another engineer to oversee the project. So it is making progress. Now, don't get me wrong, there were delays due to COVID supply chain. We were hit with that all the time. The generator took over a year 
from the original date and finally get it in place. So there are a lot of issues associated with that project. But that's kind of what's going on now, right? Uh, what are, are some of the issues in town? Uh, there's been a lot of conversations going on. Vincent is here. Vincent took the time to uh, draft the petition and get the necessary signatures to submit that to the Board of Selectmen. This was on a modification to our noise ordinance taking into consideration leaf blowers. And um, that was submitted. The petition was verified by the town clerk. By charter, we have 45 days within which to call the town meeting. Uh, there was a lot of debate back and forth. Status, we are now forming a committee, if you will, a task force, call it what you would like, to hopefully be made up of people on both sides of the issue and people who are in the middle and just want to get educated. How many people, we don't know, but you don't usually want to be over, say, 11, 9 people, because it's kind of tough to arrive at any kind of a decision with more than that. But uh, that is being done as we speak, so that is one issue that is, is on the books and we, we need to resolve that. Do we want an ordinance that restricts leaf blowers or not? Or is there somewhere in between where you can satisfy everyone because the noise pollution, uh, the exhaust from the motors, all of that is beginning to have an impact on our air quality. Uh, but at the same time, that's in town, the noise is probably the biggest factor, I would say. Living, I live in town. So every time they show up for the neighbors, you hear it. I mean, sometimes you become accustomed to it. I make the noise myself because I have a backpack. Do I invest in the battery? Uh, I have a friend who did that. He bought the lawnmower, he bought the blower, he bought the weed trimmer. He said it's wonderful. Uh, but he has a lot less grass than I do. Uh, so all of those come into consideration. That's a selfish perspective. I think overall, as a community, we need to take a good hard look at this and do what's best for everyone if we can. So Vincent, thank you for your time and efforts here. Uh, but that'll move forward. Uh, again, hopefully the task force will come to a conclusion there. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is a form of government. And some of you may have read about that. The last Charter Revision Commission actually made a recommendation back to the Board of Select Persons that we should form a committee to study the form of government. And why are we doing that? The Board of Select had actually made the suggestion originally to uh, the Charter Revision. I'm going to say Board of Select a lot. It's just, you know, 25 years of saying it's tough. So I apologize for anyone who may be concerned about that. But um, I will say on the uh, form of government, one of the issues is we have a town meeting form of government, and over 100 municipalities in the state of Connecticut still operate under a town meeting form of government. We've done it for 300 years. Some people say if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Uh, but is it broken? And that's what we want to look at, and specifically, we have had occasions, very, very minor votes, but nonetheless needed a town meeting approval per the charter. And I'll give you a specific one because this demonstrates what can happen at a town meeting. We voted, the board voted, to charge a rent of a certain 501 in town. This is going back quite a few years ago. And the question was how much. So we came up with a small amount of money. It was about $500 and about $600 a month. And we knew that there was a lot of business going through this, which was wonderful. It was a recycling type of operation. It was wonderful. It is. And uh, the owner objected. So we, we moved it forward. We scheduled a town meeting. And at the town meeting was the board, five of us and four people from the public. <laughs> Discussion, moderator called for a vote. One member of the board voted no, with the other four people in the audience leaving the four remaining board voting yes, so it failed five to four. 
It wasn't a major issue, but it exemplified someone wants to bring something through and pack the need, if you will. So at 25,000 people, uh, it's, we should look at it. What are the options out there? Is there anything better? And there are hybrids all over the place that municipalities have completed. New Canaan has a first select person with a council, and the council votes on everything. They don't, they don't have a budget referendum or a budget approved by the people. The council does it, like the Danbury. Danbury is a strong mayor form of government, meaning that they have no board of finance. Norwalk is a weak mayor form of government, where you have a board of finance that has to sign off on all the financial matters, and then everything between a simple old town meeting like we are, and other hybrids, where you have a mayor, a council, a mayor, a board, et cetera. So we want to look at all of that, and we're forming a special committee to do that as well. There's probably a million things that you may have an interest about, so I'll certainly open it up to questions. Uh, hopefully I've given you ideas about financially where we're at, uh, budget season, uh, increase, you'll have a vote, and the second Tuesday of May, Wayne is here, Vogel, our Republican Registrar of Voters. Wayne, do you know what that Tuesday date is? 12th or 14th. Okay. Uh, and then the week before, we do our annual town budget meeting at the Playhouse, uh, where there are quite a few items that may be approved that are under $100,000, and quite a bit. So uh, I urge you to follow the schedule. If you want to come to the meetings, they're all open. We try and stream everything if we have the technology. We do a town hall. Um, and then we also did a legislative meeting at East Ridge Middle School a couple of weeks ago where all four legislators for the town of Bridgeville were invited, came in, uh, and I think it was an hour and a half, hour 45 minutes, whatever it was. So I'll open the floor to questions now, if anyone. Yes? Um, I've heard floating around the idea that we might hire a town manager. What is the status of that? That's all part of the form of government. Okay. You know, the press got it all wrong, uh, <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately. I, they heard someone use an example of a town manager. Some towns have a town manager, right? And when you do a town manager, you change your form of government because the town manager becomes the chief executive officer of the town, right? And has all those authorities. You can still have a first select person, but that person uh, would be more for policy, the board would be for policy, etc. Um, and votes and approvals, but the town manager would run the day-to-day -day operations of the town. Wilton hired a town administrator, which is kind of similar. The town administrator does all of that, but you don't have to change your form of government to do it. It's a higher position, and it's a decision that the first select woman made. What she did is in order to fund the position, she reduced the salary of the first select person and used that money to cover the cost of hiring a town administrator. So she wasn't running again, Lynn didn't run again. No one wanted to run for the office because she didn't pay <laughs> So, you know, you, you've got to be sure you have all your homework done and sure that it's not going to impact the town. My personal opinion, which I would give you, I have the pulpit, right? <laughs> I'm not a boy. Um, would be, we need to be very careful because in working around the state and involved in a lot of different organizations, chief elected officials put in a lot of hours, a ton of hours, and they do that because they want to not only be sure that operations are good, and we're very fortunate here, we've got good people running everything, and it pretty much can run itself. Uh, I'm there, I ask questions, you know, uh, we all report to someone. Um, but with a town manager, you don't see that outside participation at all. Whether it's fighting for more money to stop the flow of fentanyl, and come up with programs and mental health issues and getting more money through grants to get mental health professionals here 
changing the requirements for licensing at this state. It runs the gamut. Not all town managers do that. I, I can think of probably two or three across the state now that do that kind of work. So if we're going to hire a town manager and change the form of government, we need to be very, very, very sure that that job description uh, is a requirement that they work as hard as any chief elected official. I'm 30, I, I, I grew up in this very small town, they have a mayor yep. and a town manager. It's a matter of semantics, call them administrator. Right. But there are numerous things that I think um, a town administrator could take care of that this first spectrum doesn't need to be bothered with. Like, for example, I have a very small issue coming up. The water line that's run down Barlow Mountain Road, they make a terrible mess of the side of the road. And I'm hoping that they're going to restore. Sure, all that will be restored. They don't do it in the winter, but it will. But that's something I'm reluctant to come to you about because I know you're very busy. I, I, I don't think you've hesitated in the past. <laughs> <laughs> With the and, and you were right with all of that. Your home there, you don't want that kind of construction going right in front of a, a very old home and po possibly disrupting foundations, etc. And both of those lines were moved off of Harlow Mountain into the woods to satisfy that. So yeah, feel free. Um, a town manager, uh, administrator, I don't think you would get probably the response because he's getting paid to do a job. He gets in at 8.30 or she and they leave at 4.30. Uh, the phone calls that I make after 4.30 to talk to people on different issues, it's, it's a lot of work. But you make the effort, you know why? Because these are the people that elected you. These are the people that you work for. And that's something I take to heart and is very important. And most chief elected officials do. They represent the people that elected them versus a hired position. So, cautious, that's all. Her. The uh, Charter Revision Commission had a pass, I think, I recall, moving some previously elected positions yes. to appointed positions. How do you envision that transition from elected to appointed? That would happen at the end of the terms. And my vision is that everyone in those positions just would become employees of the town fire position. I don't see any changes unless they themselves were to choose, you know what, at the end of this term, I'm done, you're gonna have to hire someone. And then the process would be uh, HR actually advertising the position. HR does the first round because a lot of applications will come in for various positions some people having zero qualifications. Some people, why did they even send anything in? HR gets rid of, purges all that uh, excess that's not necessary, and then you begin drilling down into the people that are qualified. Um, I would say like with the tax collector, we would want Board of Finance involved in that heavily. Uh, they work with the numbers. We're very fortunate, we have a wonderful tax collector, Jay Berenson Hill. He does an incredible job, very bright. Um, you couldn't ask for a better person in that job. Hopefully she'll stay here forever, but she's not. And it, she's just not going to do it forever. At what time are we going to need to replace her, and what are the qualifications? And the reason that change was made is because in the political process, you don't have to have any qualifications. You can just be Dennis Longto. Everyone knows Dennis. His name goes on the ballot. He gets elected as a tax collector. Comes to work and says, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> right? With all due respect, people, uh, the political process, I think we're at a point now with 160 million a year, we need the expertise in that office of tax collection, the technology that goes on. Um, currently, our tax collector handles all the revenues as well. They all go in through Jane and she posts them to all the correct accounts, meets with finance. So she's a huge asset. That office is a big part of the day-to-day -day operations that we need to be very careful in terms of uh, hiring the right person. Town clerk and the treasury, the same thing. Can you just hire those people without going through an HR process? I mean, no, that's what I just said. You would go through the HR but department. But I think you were going to hire the same people who were previously elected. Um, but you still would be, 
I'm always, in, in those situations, I like to establish a process so that when people the next time go back, they say, well, what did they do the last time? And if there's no reference, it, it just makes the process that much more difficult. So I think if we are confronted with the situation of having to hire someone, we would post it through HR, follow that process to a step. And even if the person that's in the position says, I'm, I'm going to keep it, chances are that's going to tell everyone else, well, forget that. Uh, but we need to establish that process. It's not formalized at this point. I would ask HR to do that there. And then you recently, on the 17th, um, you had a meeting with the Economic and Community Development Commission at your board of select persons meeting, uh, in which you discussed a, uh, a study that you commissioned with the uh, Connecticut uh, Main Street Center. Um, and there's a study that, was, that you discussed. And yes. I, wonder what, I wonder what the takeaways are from that study, and if there are any actionable recommendations from that study that you could share with us. I, not today. I didn't come prepared to talk about that specific uh, study. I don't know if I have a copy of it here. Connecticut Main Streets is an organization that's actually funded by Eversource. And most municipalities in the state of Connecticut pay a minimum fee, I think it's $2,400 to participate in this to get ideas and thoughts about Main Streets. And most of it's from an economic perspective. What do we do? We have some vacancies right now. I don't know if you've looked around town, but there are a couple of stores where the window fronts are empty. There have been some moves that have taken place. Some new people want to come in. Um, but Connecticut Main Streets helps with all of that. They have a couple of uh, consultants on board that will come and talk to you. Beyond that, I can't, I don't have specifics on that. I would have to ask Lori, who's the chair of the ECDC, what their takeaways are. Because I know they've met with leadership with Connecticut Main Streets. Anyone else? Rob? I wonder if we can talk a little bit, or if you can talk a little bit about um, uh, grants and other monies that come in from the state. I heard you talked about low SIP earlier and a little bit about money there. but. Uh, I was bored the other day and I looked at all the all the statutory aid that's in the state budget that comes to municipalities. And it looks like if, if my quick math is right, it looks like our, our the amount of money that we get on great grants and other aid programs, including for education, really hasn't gone up a lot no. over the last five or plus years. And Don't hold your breath either. And when but when you look at other towns, which I did because they gave they gave me an Excel sheet. It looks like many of the towns in, in Connecticut get a whole lot more per capita. I couldn't mm -hmm. believe it on a per capita basis. Mm -hmm. I even looked at it like against uh, against you know income tax by municipality. Yeah. A lot of other towns seem to do better. That's not criticism of, of you or anything, but how do we make sure that we're getting the maximum amount in monies back from the state, given that we certainly contribute a lot? Yeah, that. that's. Um uh, that's been an ongoing problem that we've had for many years uh, regionally with Fairfield County. Um, we get about a nickel back for every dollar we send up there, which isn't a heck of a lot in a return. Um, our ECS formula is about 570, 580, somewhere in there. That hasn't changed a lot. We used to get more. Um, but the state has delineated the uh, various municipalities, especially the distressed municipalities, which are your cities, right? Yeah. Yeah. They get a bundle. They get operating revenue. They get capital. If they build a school, 90, 92 percent of it's paid for by the state. They get 80, 90 percent money on operating. Uh, and the cry is still it's unfair. Uh, you know, there's no parity between the cities and the towns. We. Um, we could argue for more. There's some mystery formula uh, that's existed for years. At one point, I know the debate was that there were maybe one or two people in OPM that knew how to figure that out, what the formula was. It's since changed a little bit. Uh, Ridgefield is often spelled R-I-C-H, and although not spoken of, it's certainly thought of that way. Um, the president of the Senate, Martin Looney, out of New Haven, um, I was up there fighting this one. He actually had a map where he showed the entire state of Connecticut 
and he color-coded Western Connecticut as very green, and and in the sending uh, order over to the very light green in Eastern Connecticut, and said this represents the wealth in the state, and we need to get this state to one average color, basically. Mm -hmm. That meant decreasing Western Connecticut and moving that money over to the eastern side of the state. Uh, he had a lot of opposition about it, but those are the kinds of talks that are going on. We need to fight a lot harder uh, for our municipalities, but you know we're, we have a lot of wealth, and the wealth is the biggest part of the formula when they're considering how much Bridgefield is going to receive relative to uh, ECS. We do pretty well outside of there um, with the low SIP, lot SIP, although TCIP is what paid for the board for. That's local uh, traffic, local transportation capital improvement. The transportation includes pedestrian, bicycles, cars, everything. Uh, we may be using that. I mentioned Bridgeberry Road before. We may be using that to put in for three and a half million to rebuild Bridgeberry Road in another year or two as soon as the engineering is completed on that. Uh, but there's a ton of money coming out of the state of Connecticut from the federal government. Uh, not only the ARPA funds, which we have now spent down uh, completely, uh, we also have something called EJA, I-I-J-A, it's the Income Infrastructure Jobs Act. Uh, we are receiving a $350,000 grant because, remember I mentioned the rapid flashing beacons? and helping create safety for pedestrians at crosswalks. We wanted to do multiple ones, especially at all the schools, uh, just to bring a little bit more attention to the driver uh, where there, uh, that there's a crosswalk and people crossing. We were denied that money, but we're told the reason we were denied is because we have to have a town-wide safety plan. I said, well, I'll, we'll do them. We'll have it to you next week. And they said, no, 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 no. This needs to be a formal safety plan that the town hires a consultant to do. Okay, so we called around, got a few names, called the consultant, came in. They did the number $350,000 to do a safety plan of the entire town. It's, it's unbelievable. So we're doing that. Uh, that's coming together. The consultant's going to be working on that in a couple of months. Uh, then, only then can we apply for money to do rapid flashing beacons and you think it doesn't make any sense because it is safety that we're doing, but that's the process, that's the government process. Um, but there's a lot of money coming out of EJA. Uh, we're working as well with, on a more regional basis, um, some of our traffic, you know, technology is great, our phones, Waze or Google. The problem is people coming up 684, especially on a Friday afternoon, that intersection with 84 just comes to a grinding halt and it backs up in both directions. The easiest way to avoid that is to get off at 35, right? Or anywhere now because your phone will say, recalculating. <laughs> you don't have to stop, pull out the map and find out where you're at. It tells you everything, and people are getting off. And the towns to our west, our neighbors, uh, North Salem, South Salem, Vista, all of them are complaining uh, about traffic and the amount of cars that are on all these back roads. We never had traffic back up on George Washington Highway. If you go there at the 5 o'clock, it sometimes could be backed up for a mile. It's unbelievable. So we need to fix those roads working with the COD, and this is what I'm talking about, town manager and, and uh, an elected official, you hear from the people and you say, okay, why do we have so much traffic coming off of 84 using George Washington Highway? Well, they're bypassing the, uh, the delays. But what roads are they using? So at one point, I thought all I need to do is contact Ways and tell them the road has been closed. <laughs> right? Well, you can't do that every Friday. I can't mean, do that. But um, what I did do is got involved with the construction for 684, met with our uh, colleagues in New York State, became a part of that. 
uh, committee that's working on that with the state of New York, and then found out that the state of Connecticut and the rebuild for 84 that is ongoing, the construction of the engineering for it now, only started at the intersection of Route 7 and went up to exit 8. So from the mall back to New York, they weren't doing anything. And it's two lanes, right? Mm -hmm. um, if they fix 684, and from Route A or Route 4 North, you had this gap of road that both towns, and we fought for that. We said, you've got to make this part up. So they're now doing that. That's going to take, originally it was 2035. Now they've moved it up. Hopefully in the next five years, we'll see them start working on that. And that's because of all the money coming out of Washington fighting for that. So technology is another area. Um, I haven't mentioned this, but broadband has been a goal of, of the town to be able to get everyone as a result of the pandemic and the telecommuting, telelearning that went on. Um, it, it was a mess, a lot of complaints. How do we get everyone broadband availability? And the thought was, okay, we're going to get money coming out of the federal government, billions of dollars, we're going to get enough money to do it. And we'll do open access, which means you all get a choice to pick what ISP, internet service provider, you want to use. Guess what? We're not going to get all the money we need. The cost to do it on our own is $40 million. $40 million. I'm not going to bring that to the people and say, everyone can have broadband, it's just going to cost us $40 million over 20 years. Debt service, it, it doesn't make sense. Plus, the private industry, the telecoms, are looking to do that as well. So today, Frontier, and they are horrible in Ridgebury with the conventional service. Anyone lives in Ridgebury, you don't want to have Frontier. Even Comcast isn't the greatest. But Frontier is installing fiber throughout our community. And the trucks that you see, the white trucks, are all working for Frontier. We've had several meetings with them, with the uh, officials in Connecticut from Frontier. Uh, they guarantee that, I, that by the end of the first quarter, they'll have 4,800 residences, homes, that they will have fiber in the street that you can connect to. 4,800 of our roughly 9,500 households, right? So they're about half, call it. Um, what we said is, are you going to be doing everyone? And they said, no. We're going to do the areas that we can get to that are the easiest. Some of the access ways and streets with very few uh, residences that totaled over 900, they're not going to do it. And they said, because it doesn't pencil out. And I said, what would it cost? I hear my phone, I'm sorry. Um, we need to get everyone, because we don't want to end up with the haves and the have-nots, right? Uh, so they gave us a price, if we're willing to kind of become a partner with them, sign an agreement, that they will guarantee every house in Ridgefield will have coverage, but it could cost us up to $1.5 million. And they'll guarantee 100% saturation in this community. That's where we're at right now. We're kind of negotiating that. So we have a meeting coming up in March, March 25th, with Chief Counsel uh, for Frontier, who lives in Ridgefield. And I think that's part of the reason why uh, they want to get Ridgefield straightened out, uh, is to be able to get some good publicity. and. Uh, we may end up bringing that forward. Obviously, you'd all have to vote on it. Um, there'll be a lot of discussion, a lot of transparency, a lot of public hearings. Once we feel this is the best solution, but working in a small group on this, um, none of us wanted to go with an existing telecom because you're at, that, at their mercy. And open access would be so much better in terms of freedom of choice, in that each one of you could pick whoever you wanted. You would have a basic fee for the cost of the infrastructure that may be $40, 50 $60 a month. I don't know what the 
bonding and the debt service would work out to be. But then we're taking a gamble because it depends on what the take rate is. The take rate being how many people are going to sign up. And you need at least 40 to 50 percent to have it make sense. That's a risk. And are we willing to go forward with a $40 million proposal that has that kind of risk? Especially when the private sector is going to come in and do it. Um, so right now what we're doing is trying to come up with some kind of a long-term agreement that puts a not to exceed on the amount of the increase. I don't know if we're going to be successful there. Probably not, but hopefully we get something close to that. So on broadband. Again, that's all the money coming out of uh, out of the federal government. Sir, in the back, you had a question before? Um, yes. I was thinking, um, listening to the plan you have with Burnfield, um, with the yes. development, and also the walkway that is being proposed and being built this year by the Rec Center. While you're doing that, do you have any study of what that will do to the traffic since you're in the uh, to, to that area? Any, uh, on what? Sorry, I missed that. Those developments, would, has any studies been done what those developments would be do, doing to the traffic around that area? Yeah, that, you know, in a way, I, obviously it would increase. Development, you're going to have traffic increase. There's no doubt about it. How much will be dependent on density? How much will be dependent on Can we improve the level of service with the trains? Can we get more and more people into public transportation rather than clogging our streets? So there's a lot of unknown, but to basically answer your question, yeah, there's no doubt. Uh, but this, and the one part I did not mention to you, and, and I'll say I've been criticized for uh, offering to be a partner with Desegregate Connecticut. It's a terrible name of that organization. However, I would be a partner because they're so loud and they have leverage at the state, like it or not, that I would rather have them be a partner than a foe. And I'll tell you why. Two years ago, the plan was to mandate to every municipality in the state of Connecticut a minimum number of affordable units. Richfield was 1,500. So under 8-30G, that means we would roughly have to fill 4,500 units to get 1,500 units in the next 20 years. That's crazy. Where do you build them? What about traffic? What about education, et cetera? And they also were going to require that we change the zoning on our main street. Now, a lot of towns it's not called main street, maybe called something else, but your main road through town to change your zoning from one acre, if it is, to four units an acre, I think it was, Rob, up to four units an acre, which would change the character of our street immensely. And a lot of us move here because you drive down Main Street and say, ah, oh, I'm home, right? That could be gone. So we needed, I felt, we needed to come up with a plan that addressed the demands of the state relative to their mandates, drew the attention away from Main Street we still have building going on on Main Street, but not with what the state wanted to do. So how can we address housing? And originally, when 8-30G was passed back in 1989, the one of the guiding uh, parameters of it is that they wanted it to be near public transportation. Don't build an affordable housing project up in West Mountain, because now you're taking people and putting them in such a remote area. How are they going to get to work? Where are they going to get to work? Et cetera, et cetera. So locate it near transportation. And that's kind of what I went back to. How can we do that? Branchville, uh, we, during this study, uh, we did a lot of work with the neighborhoods. There were charrettes that we had right in this room, uh, charrettes being little meetings. We invited everyone that came in. We had multiple tables set up where you sat, you looked at the plan. Yes, no, what are your thoughts? And at a 30,000 foot level, but that's how it got to here. 
The next round is working with planning and zoning to take a look at that concept and what is it going to look like and taking into consideration the traffic impact, et cetera, and all those variables will be public hearings. These don't have answers yet, but good question. Anyone else? Yes. I'm curious what you are looking at when it comes in front of you. Um, I know most people say that uh, it ultimately can only be cut, but I understand you actually could recommend a addition. I don't know if that's true. Sure. I'm asking if that's true. Sure, you could. Okay. You and can do that. You can, Board of Finance could do that. Ultimately, Board of Finance will decide. Yeah. The Board of uh, Select People just makes a non-binding recommendation. And previous to that, we had no say. And I would go to stop and shop, and people would say, what are you going to do? Something about our taxes. This is crazy. And I say, well, 60 70% of the budget, I have, don't even go there with me. <laughs> so what I said to the board is, why don't we ask Charter Revision to look at giving the board of selectmen some kind of an input on the education budget so that people are hearing discussion and the thoughts of other elected officials in the town. There is no guideline whether we say it goes down or goes up. We do look at the impact that the budget has on the tax rate because we're elected by the people. As is the Board of Education, and I'm sure they look at it too. We look at it more in partnership with everything else we're doing. You know, the capital plan I was talking about at 10 million. The, the roof was for Ridgeberry School. A lot of people said, why did you take that out? Um, we, because it went up to 2.4 million, and we need to look at what's the best way to do our roofs. We'll probably delay that a year. I don't see it being any longer than that. Um, this is an interesting fact. Our director of facilities went up to the school. Um, actually, it was Barlow, I think, uh, with a consultant to look at a roof, and there are a bunch of seagulls. So the consultant looked at him and said, uh, is there an ocean near here? He said, an ocean? <laughs> no, there was Pierpont Lake right across the street. Why? And he said, we got all these seagulls. What we found out, seagulls will peck through the rubber membrane and pull the insulation out to build nests. It's, it's incredible what happens to a roof. Um, so anyway, we did take it out this year. Getting back to the operating, we'll look at it as a whole. Uh, it's not our job to get into individual line items at all. Um, and, you know, the uh, superintendent often will go through the budget discussing all that, which does generate questions. Uh, but it's not the charter. We're, we're not charged with the responsibility of looking at That's why we have a Board of Education. The budget they bring to us uh, is the budget that they feel is important for the education of the kids in this town. And we do look at education as a very, very important component of the overall mix of our community. Like we look at Main Street that I was talking about. Education, if people are going to move to this area, and fewer do now, but uh, years past, wh what is your school system like? What is it ranked? How is it compared to the other area? Uh, Fairfield County or even out further. And we've always said, we're not the top, but we get a heck of a good education for our kids, and that's important in rounding out the attractiveness, our overall quality of being rich here. Yeah. And as such, thinking of the board of select people as um, kind of voicing community fighters, um, that's what I was thinking about how we might view the board of budget um, when it comes in front of you. And so things like um, how we are, since you pointed out, since 2019, the first cultural district mm -hmm. in our state. Yet, since 2020, we can't meet state uh, standards for our art, elementary art minutes. And nothing has changed. Nothing's proposed to change. And that was a big spotlight that we should be looking at when we are in cultural district. Yet our elementary kids, K-5, are not getting out the minutes. 
do we, do we you know, I, I don't look at that. Yeah. I'll be very honest with you. It does it concern me as a resident? I may look at it, mm -hmm. but as the first select person, no. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not my job. It's not my responsibility. That would take me away from other areas like the highway or engineering or other things, so many things that we're trying to do. That's why we have a superintendent that's hired and, and an administration and with a board of education that's responsible for look who are the elected to do that job. And they have a lot of public hearings. Okay, we're running low on time. Tom? Rudy, you mentioned highway. <coughs> you mentioned the uh, Ridgeberry, Ridgeberry area roads, uh, Ridgeberry Road in particular. I spent a little bit of time up there. Are we going to rebuild that road so that cars are going even faster than they are now? <laughs> you know, um, that's what happens with every road we pay. People will complain for a good uh, a year or two. It's probably four or five years by the time we get to it. Uh, the road's horrible, it needs to be paved, we paved it. The calls start, you need to stop these speeding cars, it's crazy, they're going so fast. We put up the speed limit signs. Uh, inevitably, when you pave a road, cars are going to drive fast. That's what happens. We looked at speed bumps. Uh, Reading has a few in Portland, if, if you go down there. Uh, our highway department doesn't like them because of the snow. Uh, and plows, makes it very difficult. Um, and it's also somewhat of a safety concern uh, with school buses. If you get out of school and there's snow and kids are yelling and hollering on the bus and you miss the sign and you hit one of those, it, it could uh, throw the bus off uh, course. So those are the reasons. Um, with speeding cars, uh, that traffic, that accident this morning, um, what happened? Why was that car, why did that car continue to drive into the car in front of me that just caused a knee and a heart? Was it a medical condition or whatever? But the speed of cars unquestionably has gotten to be greater and greater. And the diversions, unfortunately, are greater and greater too. Technology, you know, even though it's hands-free, you're, you're still looking. And you see people doing this all the time. Uh, police have been very successful setting up the uh, plain clothesman and governor just standing there, you know, keeps pressing the button like he's trying to cross and watches the car go by and he'll say, you know, what are I? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the car's right down the bailey, come here, you're on your phone. That works, we should do more of that. But the speeding cars, sometimes we talk about putting those speed indicator signs up. Um, but uh, once people get used to it, the only thing, and this always confused me, you have radar set up. And a lot of people call, and I'll call Nick Fowler now, who's in charge of that, and I'll say, Captain, can you set up radar? Yep, no problem, we'll be there next Tuesday. And you go over there, and the cars coming in the opposite direction are flashing their lights. Why do they do that? It defeats the purpose of it. You see, it on Main Street all the time. It's frustrating, but yeah, speed will pick up and then it settles down. Thanks. Last question, Linda? I don't have a question, I have an invitation. Thank you for updating us on Ridgefield locally. 10 days from now on Saturday, February 24th, the League and the Library are sponsoring a Meet Your Legislators event. So all four of our legislators will be here up on the stage Saturday, 10 a.m., February 24th. I invite you all to attend and shift your questions to questions about the state and what's happening in the legislature. One last important, it's in, it's in our capital, but our fountain is in need of repair. If you, I, I ask you to go up and look at the last time, what was it, 2001, two in there when the Hummer hit it, completely wrecked it, it was all put together, uh, it's lasted for 20 years, but it needs help. And we have an angel who has come forward and said he's willing to pay for half, but he wants it to be a project that extends down 35, because he said 35 is the gateway to the town coming in from Katona. Peter Parley, redo the landscaping, leave the house exactly the way it is. 
but to put a curbing around it, better grass, maybe a walkway, a more appropriate outhouse, right? Because there's no bathroom in there. Uh, but to really give it um, recognition as a, as a point of interest coming into town. And then the next point you come to is Old Steady Lane, where there's a fountain that used to be, actually it's a horse trough, that used to be right in front of town hall for years, and it was moved over to the intersection of West Lane and Homestead, is to fix that up, put some water in it, give it some spotlights, new landscaping. So that's this project. We're going to be looking, he is looking for private donations as well uh, to help fund this. It'll be on the budget, but it'll be a 50% match by outside funds. I didn't want to forget to bring that up. Because I know people love that. Well, I'm not going to get up there. I want to thank you so much, Ruby, for coming along today. Sure. And uh, you constantly impress me with the breadth of your knowledge of all the different aspects of our government. Sponsoring the Beatville Legislatures with the library. If you want to attend, you do have to register. So if you go to the library event market, register, you get an email. It's in person at the here, 10 till 12, two weeks' time. Be there or be square. I mean, <laughs> <laughs>